I'm going to invite Hope to share um, a, be a brief practice with us as people join this session. So over to you. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks very much, Mary Ann. Um, culture change and culture change requires change requires expansion. If we don't expand, we are never going to change. We have to expand and see the world beyond structures, see the world beyond systems, see the world, you know, in a broad way. I'm going to do an ex expand our lives, expand our hearts, expand our bodies, bodies but above all, expand, expand our minds. I hope that you 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 can see me. So I'm afraid you have to stand up wherever you are, and I hope that you are wearing something user friendly. Uh, so the exercise is like, as you say, as you go down, you know, you breathe out loud. So it's like, okay. So can we do this together? <laughs> <laughs> so if you have just eaten, be careful. Uh, but it puts energy in the body, and as you are doing, tell yourself that you're expanding. You expand because we are capable of that. So we are going to do it ten times. We'll see how we are, and then try another ten times. So. <laughs> So as you do it, you expand the lungs, you expand the heart, and down you expand, you expand the groin. You know the groin usually does to expand. So let's give it a chance. We are going to try 10 more times. And then if you are tired, we'll stop. If you are not tired, we'll continue. Okay, so we start. Maybe for people who can't stand up, they could do it at their desk or, you know, they could well, do it at half You can do it when they are sitting. Yeah. If you are sitting, you can just go <laughs> like... I hope if you are sitting, the chair is friendly so that you don't sit on the edge of the chair and avoid hitting the chair with your uh, arm. So... <laughs> So I'm going to stand. So I'm going to stand and I apologize to those who. So let's start. Let's start. You expand as you expand. Your lungs expanding. Your heart is expanding. You bend the legs a little so the brain is expanding. If you do this 50 times, you are done for the day because it touches every part of the body. So we are starting. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Take a minute to rest. Just think about expansion. Just ask yourself. From expanding. What are some of the constraints? From expanding. Expanding inside. Expanding the mind. Expanding your views. Really expanding and looking at the world in its diversity abundancy and richness. So just take a moment and ask yourself if there are things that stop you from Have you looked at the abundance of the world, the diversity, the richness of your own heart, your own mind, your own body, <laughs> what the body can do, what your mind can do, what you spiritual, what you can do, intellectually, what you can do. Let's ex about it. So two minutes and then we'll start. Oh. 
Okay, so over to you, uh, Mary Ann, or is it me? Yeah, no, hi everyone and welcome to this session. Um, our first session this afternoon, like UK and Geneva time, it might be evening or morning with you. So good morning, <laughs> good afternoon, good evening. Um, and welcome to our session on culture and behavior change in aid organizations. I think uh, I certainly needed that um, brief pause um, to move my body and reflect. And um, I hope some of you enjoyed it also. We're going to welcome two guests who are with us for this conversation. Um, and they are Nadia and Tosca. And we are going to start with Nadia. And actually, um, we, we'll, we'll tell you a little bit about them, but also ask them to sort of add anything that we miss. <laughs> So um, Nadia Abu Amr is a policy officer at UNHCR's Office of the Senior Coordinator on the Protection of Sexual Exploitation and Abuse and Sexual Harassment. I had to read it and it didn't fit in the hop-in profile, so sorry about that. <laughs> um, but her area of focus is on organisational culture and combating the underlying issues that give rise to sexual misconduct. Um, and she has a background in international protection and experience in emergencies in Europe, Asia and the Middle East. And so we're going to hear from Nadia about some research she's been doing around organisational culture. So she's going to share briefly and then we'll also invite Tosca to share about her work with us. And then we're going to have a discussion and we'll have some reflection questions and invite some of you listening to get involved in that discussion also. But if we begin with you, Nadia, welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much, Marianne. And uh, thank you, Hope, for, for that very energizing exercise. <laughs> it was a wonderful way to start. Um, as, as Marianne mentioned, um, I work for UNHCR and I work specifically on protection from sexual exploitation and abuse and sexual harassment. Um, but in, in, under the umbrella of that work, uh, one of our areas of focus is on uh, organizational culture, organizational culture change, and behavior change. Um, it's, uh, I think, important to acknowledge first and foremost that uh, issues of sexual misconduct are rooted in in culture, in 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 individual behavior, in collective culture, and. In order to address those issues, we really do need to dig down deep um, and look at organizational culture and the issues that give rise to them. And we mainly focus on um, the power imbalances that, that drive this kind of behavior and the gender equalities that really serve as the foundation for it. Um, over the course of the last year, one of the areas I've been focusing on is actually looking at what different organizations across the sector are doing on uh, culture change and organizational culture change. Um, I have spent the last year reaching out to various UN agencies, NGOs, and networks uh, to understand, number one, how they approach culture, because we all approach culture in very different ways. We define it in very different ways. Uh, but also what kinds of initiatives they have in place to make adjustments to um, certain elements of their organizational culture that they view as uh, in need of some kind of shift, of um, uh, some kind of repair in a way. And I uh, managed to collect 12 uh, examples for this collection. Um, I should also note that this collection is an initiative that has uh, been part of the UNHCR's High Commissioner, um, his championship on uh, protection from sexual exploitation and abuse and sexual harassment um, under the rubric of the IASC. And so this is one of the deliverables that we are uh, releasing hopefully in a couple of weeks um, as part of that championship. Uh, just to say very quickly a little bit about this, this product, it's intended to be a resource for, uh, for everyone across the sector, both humanitarian and development organizations, 
to look at different examples of how different organizations put in place initiatives on, on uh, organizational culture change. Um, it includes initiatives on learning, on promoting staff dialogue, uh, working on addressing issues around masculinities, uh, community engagement, um, leadership and promoting the respectful use of authority, uh, promoting uh, agreed values, working on power dynamics, unconscious bias, um, and also promoting speak up culture so that people are enabled to, to speak up and challenge issues in an open and free manner. Uh, there are some initiatives that look directly at capacity building um, and on measuring impact, because at the end of the day, um, it, it's it, working on organizational culture can very much be an intangible uh, element of our work. And so there are some creative ways in which various organizations have looked at measuring the impact of the work that's done on organizational culture. Um, this report, this resource, as I mentioned, is in the process of finalization, and we hope to have it out in the next couple of weeks. And of course, it will be made publicly available um, as a resource for everyone. So um, as soon as we have released it, I will make sure that um, it is available to the network here so that it can be disseminated to all those who are interested. And I think I will hand over back to you, Marianne, and uh, I'm happy to answer questions in the chat if there are any. Sure, sure. And we, we'll talk a bit more about what you learned and stuff in when we have our discussion. Um, I think Hope you were going to introduce Tosca, but I just I was about to go into it and I thought, oh no, I'm, <laughs> I'm off screen. Go ahead, go ahead. You're on mute. I hope you're on mute. <laughs> yeah, you're back. I say, when I think of Tosca, I think of a weaver. So I've got <laughs> these baskets that, you know, I was thinking about when I read your CV. Oh. And that's I say a weaver because of the work that you have done. You have you're a consultant uh, in the in the, the, the consulting firm that you created, Five Oaks. Uh, you have worked in international international organizations. You've worked for um, civil society organizations on different issues for thirty years. Worked in academic World Bank, UN and a range of other organizations. And in all these organizations, you seem to, to pull ideas and continue bringing them together as to expand our world and expand your own world. You've designed 25 NGO training programs. We wish we could see those. And helped senior NGOs to read dramatic and useful change. We need you right now. <laughs> to change our culture dramatically because the issues we are dealing with need that dramatic change. Thanks for expanding our world, our perspectives, and the way we see things around us. We are very happy to have you here and please, the floor is yours. Wow, that was an amazing introduction. I'm going to remember that and uh, Lovely. I loved it, the way you, you uh, characterized that image of, of weaving. Yeah, so um, I don't have much to add to what, uh, how Hope introduced me. I think she put the, the um, to put it very right, I'm a former international development practitioner who then became uh, an accidental pracademic, as I like to call it. It's not a term I coined, by the way, but I do like it and it suited me in my recent past at Syracuse University at the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. And now I'm an independent consultant. And by the way, my company is called Five Oaks Consulting because my very difficult to pronounce Dutch last name means of the five oak trees. Um, so my work on 
Um, I, I first want to be really transparent about what I don't offer. So I am not an expert on staff wellness or on safeguarding. Um, I have done a lot of work on uh, organizational effectiveness, uh, change management, leadership development, and, and um, organizational culture work. And um, I like to think about the, the, the cultures of INGOs and to some extent uh, foundations in order to see to what extent, not just how can we uh, preserve what is good and change what needs to change, but also how can we, in a constructive way, expose the gaps between what we say our cultures are and what they what they really are because un, until we close that gap between what academics call the espoused culture the, the culture we aspire to and what we really the really use behaviors that are being um, activated on a daily basis uh, we can't really make many other useful changes as well um, so for me just to give a, a quick introduction to how i think about culture because i want to look at make sure that i stay within my time is for me organizational cultures are about the everyday shared habits and behaviors so a lot of uh, of us folks in the NGO world like to talk in a, a fairly fairly abstract levels about our principles our values and our belief systems and there is some value to that but I really like to pull it down to what are the actual habits and behaviors that are um, very tenacious that are enduring, that are constantly reinforced in our organization or that are um, discouraged. Because I think it's a bit easy to talk about these high uh, values and principles and it makes us very feel very good, right? It gives us that warm, fuzzy glow, but actually that warm, fuzzy glow about our identity working in the INGO sphere or in international development organizations is actually, I think, um, part of the problem. So. Um, I think it's important to understand that if we talk about habits and behaviors, one thing that I'd like to say up front is that a lot of us in the development sector seem to think that if we change our mindsets, that will lead to changes in behaviors. But actually, I'm, I'm rather interested in the neuroscience behind leadership and leadership development. And the neuroscience will tell us that our behaviors drive our thinking as much as the other way around. So it's not necessarily that our thinking will change our behaviors, but our behaviors will um, uh, change our thinking. And that's why it's really important, I believe, in culture change work that we focus only on a few habits at any one time, a few behaviors that we want to change, and try to uh, reinforce um, those through our organizational systems and processes, through, of course, leadership models, but also not just through modeling by formal positional power leaders, if you will, but also by um, informal leaders. So culture carriers, people who are ambassadors of the kinds of behaviors that we want to see more of, people who are big um, uh, nodes in networks through which a lot of communication uh, flows, if you will, people who are looked up to, by others and that others want to imitate what, what academics like to call social proofing. So those are a couple of um, things that I think are important when it comes to uh, culture and behavior change that uh, maybe um, I wanted to say off the, off, the, off the top. So maybe handing it back to, to Hope and Marianne at this point and see what you want to talk about. Thanks, Oscar. I'm interested in the idea of culture carriers and thinking about like how in, in some ways maybe we're all culture carriers and what are the, you know, and so maybe I'll just you know, ask you back, like, are we all culture carriers or are there, you know, or, or is it that there's some people that get off without being, you know, is there, is it something we all need to think about? How are we carrying the culture within an organization? Nadia, do you want to go first? Sorry, I'm having trouble with my mute button. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, I, I, I really like this term of culture carriers because I think, you know, it's important to recognize that we all have a role in, in culture as 
culture carriers, regardless of how it's defined. Um, I think it's it's important that we acknowledge that each and every one of us has a role. Um, but I think in 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 structures that we, we what that we work in, in organizations that we that we work in, I think it's also very important to emphasize the role of of leadership as well. You know, it needs to be both bottom down and top up um, because unfortunately in in structures like this you do need um, the example set at the top to open up space for uh, for groups and individuals to mobilize to be culture leaders at, at the grassroots level where it's able to be spontaneous it's able to be independent but you do need that support from from leadership that helps guide um, organizations in one direction or another. So I think yes, we all are culture culture carriers, um, but in some ways uh, we need to be given the space to be powerful culture carriers. Yeah, I I would say um, definitely reinforcing first what Nadia said around you need bottom up and top down. And I emphasize the bottom up um, initially because um, the idea that one can change culture uh, entirely through corporate level uh, kind of change initiatives has been kind of um, discounted a bit. You need, you need both. So, so um, it is very important what Nadia said is that um, leaders who are in formal positional power need to absolutely walk the talk. And it's because staff watch what leaders do, not so much what they say, but what they do. So for instance, if in a senior team, there is one um, leader who exhibits behaviors that are uh, not congruent with the officially espoused kind of behaviors that we want to see more of, um, and is seen to be getting away with that, because that leader brings in other talents, other attributes that the organization also needs, um, people will see that and they will say, okay, that means that we're not really serious. Now, I don't, in my work, I don't feel the need to be um, kind of moralizing about um, 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 leadership behavior. I do understand that because my work is a lot about how organizational level leaders deal with culture change in this case. Organizational leaders have a lot of competing interests, a lot of competing stakeholders with com competing expectations, and they have, um, a, they even have to balance competing values. And I don't want to diminish that. That's a very uh, complex kind of, kind of job, but definitely reinforcing what, uh, what Nadia said. And then finally, Marianne, to your question on, are we all culture carriers? Yes, we are. I mean, we know from the research that people are socialized into organizational cultures within six to 12 months. And after that, it is the water you swim in and you don't notice it anymore. That is why it's so useful to ask or interview people who have just entered the organization, let's say a couple of months, uh, to say, what are you noticing about the behaviors that are, um, that are held up here as examples? Who are the heroes here? Who does the official leader defer to in meetings? Because these new people still see that. So let me stop there. Interesting. Hope, I don't know if you wanted to add your own reflections um, so far. And, in, and we'll also invite people, sorry, as I say that, invite people to be putting any questions you have in the Q&A and I'll be monitoring that as we discuss and share mm -hmm. together. Go ahead, Hope, sorry. Mm -hmm. I see that the way organizations are formed, the way they are created, forms the way they behave. If, a, if a, uh, an organization is created by a leader who really was not, who, who, who to begin with was not thinking about culture and culture change, it becomes very difficult. So two days ago, I was with an organization that works on issues of SRHR, sexual health and reproductive rights. And they, they, they are interested in the litigation. 
So I asked them to draw an SRHR map of Uganda. They drew the map and, you know, it looked okay. But there was um, a transgender The map is said, you know, I can see myself there. There was uh, someone living with disability. I have not seen my issues there. And, you know, there were others, but the, the leader himself is a lawyer, had already congratulated himself and was really happy. Ha, 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 very happy that the map, this is the SRHR map of Uganda. And, and he was dancing that we have done it and done it well and it really looked so beautiful. So I, I think that the way, when he created this organization, he had litigation. In but he is a man, he's a man, he's you know, a young man, and he's a lawyer, um, and, you know, issues of other sexual orientation, disability, you know, sex work and others, we are not in his world. So I find that the challenge is how to make people move from the world that heteronormativity, for example, and then, you know, that change, what does it need? How does one introduce that change? Or how does one convince them that the world we are living in is diverse and you can't just focus on one thing? Thanks so much, Hope. I'm going to come to, there's a few questions in the Q&A, so I'm going to come to those um, and see where we go with them. So there's a question that someone's asked, what is needed to provide the structures and to give the space for culture change? So what is needed to provide the structures and to give the space for culture change? Um, who shall I come to first? Go ahead, Nadia, go ahead. I, I was actually going to say, uh, see if Tosco wants to go first this time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, let me see. So what is needed, first of all, is um, a couple of things. One is uh, acknowledging that being honest about the fact that, uh, that there may be gaps between what we say our cultures are and what our real constantly reinforced behaviors uh, are. And by the way, those, those behaviors that, were, that have been constantly reinforced, there was often a good reason for that, right? These behaviors are very tenacious. They don't change easily because they worked for the organization for a long time, right? So there was a good reason for that, even if we now think those, those, those behaviors are no longer um, uh, helpful for, for whatever reason. So being honest about the gap between what we say we are about and what our real in-use behaviors and valued behaviors are is, is one thing. The second thing is making culture less fuzzy, right? It is a very abstract term. It can be hard to see, although, again, how you can see culture is, for instance, what kind of humor is allowed? Who uh, and what is this not, not uh, authorized in the organization? Who do formal leaders defer to in meetings? Who do they hold up as uh, heroes? What kind of artifacts, meaning what kind of material things do we see around offices or in our communication materials? etc cetera, etc cetera. so trying to bring it down to very concrete things so that people don't poo poo it as something that's way too fuzzy and i don't have time for this and then uh, maybe my last thing um is is again understanding that behaviors change thinking as much as thinking changes behavior so if i can make an analogy to the whole emphasis on diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging now, I see in the NGO sphere, there's a lot of emphasis on cognitive awareness. We all need to be reading, we're discussing, we're debating. We're, um, it's, it's a lot of focus on cognitive awareness, but cognitive awareness does not necessarily lead to behavior change. There's not much evidence for that. So focusing in the beginning on a few behaviors mm -hmm. that we can hold up in our minds, because humans can only remember a few priorities at a time and immediately starting to both model as, as Nadia was emphasizing um, immediately starting to embed those desired behaviors into organizational processes and systems 
because otherwise behaviors can slip back quite easily. So they need to be reinforced through like uh, things like how you hire, how you onboard, how you um, give people choice assignments, how you engage in talent management, how do you do performance management. So those would be a couple of things I would say. Thanks, Tosca. And Nadia, I might come to you on that, but also um, I've seen another question that you, I don't know whether this might, be, so so maybe you could, if you want to add on, on that one, you could, but also there's a question about, um, we often see different cultures inside different country offices of the same organisation, or and um, usually due to maybe the approach of local senior management. Is that something that an organization needs to do something about? Is it okay if I'm, I'm slightly expanding on the question that's here, but like, is it okay if cultures vary across an international organization or do we need something that's standardized? And alongside that, I'll, I'll ask it together. And maybe we can all respond. There's a question about across the humanitarian ecosystem. Is there a need for a shared understanding and framework about organizational culture? Like, do we need to map out what, what are, um, our, our kind of shared culture should look like. Nadia, I just gave you like three questions. If if I may, I'm actually going to respond to them in reverse because I think the last one can encapsulate some of uh, the other questions that have been asked. Um, I I think yes, uh, there is there is room for a shared culture. And I don't think that needs to be defined or rigid. But from what we've seen looking at how different organizations work on culture, and especially as it pertains to PSEA and SH, is that one of the, the pillars of shared culture across the sector is, is trying to achieve, trying to promote genuinely open workspaces, genuinely open organizations where people can dare to speak up and people can dare to challenge and people can dare to question and disagree and debate and have the space to, to be genuinely included and heard and Re realize and know that they are empowered to do so, but that they will actually be heard. It's not just a, a drop box where you leave your comment that no one ever reads. It's a genuinely open space where people are empowered to speak, feel safe to speak, and can, can question and challenge uh, both their peers as well as their authority. And I think one of one of the points that Tosca has made, I think, is very important in in playing into this, and that is the point about behavior changing mindset. And one of the things we've seen a lot of work done around is looking at how you can work with that mindset. And there have been a number of initiatives where, um, you know, it it starts at in the center of the circle, looking at the individual, looking at yourself. Uh, it starts with reflection and awareness of your own behavior and how, how to actually uh, be more uh, alive to your own, your own uh, unconscious bias, your, whether conscious or unconscious, your own behavior, how that impacts those around you, how that impacts uh, uh, individuals you supervise, how that impacts the individual who's supervising you. And I think it starts with promoting this idea of we all have an individual role to play. And to understand that, we actually need to be more self-aware. We need to be more reflective. We need to, we need to assess what our behavior actually is. Um, I will leave it here, but I'm happy to go into more detail on this topic. Hope, would you like to jump in? We say that fish starts rotting from the head. And that, you know, that, that, that is uh, uh, the case. 
But again, um, I, I, I find that there is a lot of fear in organizations. There are, there are some people who know what to do. I talked about in the morning, this fear of will the funders say, you know, is this the right thing to do? Is this, you know, if I do this, will I be acceptable? Uh, and sometimes that fear is unfounded, but it is there and it's very so I, I, I don't know, know how we can deal with that fear. It's like NG, if you talk if we talk about NGOs, be it international or, or national, it's like this is the way organizations are set up. These are the systems that are needed. These are the structures. These are the stra strategies. There might be differences here and there, but there is that you know that belief that if you don't have this structure, then you cannot operate. And even when you 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 know uh, we talk to people about changes, they say yeah, but are we going to get funding? If we change this, are we going to get funding? I don't know how we can overcome that fear, and maybe part of it. Just yes. said in the morning, you know, this is corrective effort. One organization might be very difficult. So how do we move as a collective? So that you know, when we 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 say we are really changing, we change, and it's not just one organization which remains very secure and perhaps you know and might be cold and professional. Mm. I I wanted to return to Mary Ann's question on um, you know national offices and national organizational cultures. Yeah, I I, I think it's very normal. It's not always helpful for organizations to have subcultures. They can be, um, as you said, national offices that of course are infused not just by the national leadership, but by the national culture. And then sometimes people get this confused. I, I think they, they talk about the culture and I wanna know, are we talking about national culture or regional culture or organizational culture? But of course these national cultures influence also what are the kind of authorized behaviors and habits uh, or the things that are disliked. Um, the same with, you know, professional guilds, by what, what I mean, you know, often uh, like a, um, a finance unit in an NGO or a foundation will have a slightly different subculture, right? Or facilities or legal counsel, etc. That is very normal. And as long as everybody has some overriding both habits and behaviors and belief systems behind that, that we can all share, it's not necessarily a problem. You just need to be aware of it. Um, I, I wanted to come back also, Mary Ann, to your question. Is it realistic for us to strive for a shared culture? Is that, did I understand the question? Question about, yeah, was it, um, the actual question was like, should there be like a, a framework on organizational culture kind of across the sector, like a shared framework of what culture should look like? So I'm gonna maybe take, um, slightly different angle to this than, than Nadia uh, did. And I'm gonna say that that is not realistic. Um, many organization, organizations have their own cultures. They're often formed initially by the founders or heavily influenced by the founders. And over time can change as a result of collectors of staff that, that, that um, um, uh, um, you know, articulate new habits and behaviors that they think are important or new, uh, especially strong or uh, charismatic leaders. Um, I think it's not necessarily something we want, to, we, we don't necessarily want to share, um, strive for a shared organizational culture, but we do want to um, strive for shared principles that are enacted in different organizational cultures differently. So through different vectors. So some organizations are more, for instance, centralized or corporate in their culture. Others are much more freewheeling, loose or bottom up. So the vectors through which um, we diffuse new habits or behaviors that we want to encourage may be different. Some are very formal, some are very informal, some are more social movement like, some are highly structured. So the vectors through which we um, want to influence cultures may, may be different. I do think we obviously as a sector want to have some shared values and, and principles and belief systems, um, but not necessarily um, in the same culture, if that makes sense. Totally, Tosca. And there's some um, other interesting questions coming. 
Um, Meg is asking, I'd like to know more on how best to go about reinforcing good behaviors in organizations, because I'm not sure that we do enough of this. So how do we reinforce good behaviors? <laughs> I'm gonna put good like that because maybe we might not all agree exactly what those are, but, but if even if we're if if they're different to some extent between organizations how do we reinforce them well, i mean i think i might say just something briefly i think um there's you know we, you, you, I, one or two of you have already talked about um you know the modeling of behavior mm. right and the, you know, it's the practice, the, the continued practice and the continued, artic, you know, intentionality, I guess, about showing that it, this is how we do, not this is what we say and we do something different. I think, unfortunately, <laughs> it's that kind of long term practice that will shift culture in the long term. And I always think of it like, We've all got a role to play in that and it's a collective endeavor and you can't, it's not one or the other. So it's like, we've all got a small role to play and together we shift culture. It isn't, and, and you've all alluded to this in different ways. It's not one thing or the other. We can shift culture over time by all doing things differently. So modeling those behaviors over time with intention and continuing to do it, I think. I, I think I'm repeating myself now. So I'll, who, who, who else would like to add on that one? <laughs> I think if I may just jump in very briefly, I, there is a very critical point in, in your statement in the statement that you just made and that it is, it is um, a long game. Culture, it, you don't, change behavior by doing one thing you set up this program you you know have an initiative and voila <laughs> behaviors changed it is a long term investment and i agree that modeling is a critical element of that but i think uh, another is the recognition that it is a long term investment and requires uh requires patience and staying the course. Um, I think, you know, it, it's also important to consider things like staff turnover and what that means in trying to ensure that modeling the right behavior is consistent. So it does need to be continuous there. It, it does need to be multifaceted, but definitely your point about time is, is of paramount importance. I, I want to strongly endorse what Nadia just said. I see sometimes uh, quite unrealistic um, um, expectations. So I've heard very senior organizational leaders say, I changed the culture of my organization in a year. I think that that is BS. That is not, the, the, the research in the private and the public sector will tell you and the practice will tell you that is just not possible. It's Typically, we're talking about at least five to seven years of, as Nadia says, is consistent, intentional repetition of behaviors you want to see more of. So to, to come to, to Meg's question, particularly, how do we model that good behavior? So again, I think it needs that too has to come, has to be done by people at the top, but also by people, um, not the, I don't like that word, the bottom. Um, by people who are these who are already natural um uh, culture carriers who other people look up to who other people want to imitate um and those uh if the formal leaders model and do so consistently um and if the informal leaders and cultural carriers those those strong nodes in networks right uh, like, oh, if I need to know something about the organization, I go to a person X, they, they know how it works here. If those are um, consistent, as Nadia said, over a longer term, then other people want to imitate them. They, that's social proofing. If managers, so for instance, when you look at managers and uh, DEI training, if managers go to voluntary DEI training, not necessarily because they um, 
because they strongly think that this is an important thing to do, but they go anyway. Then afterwards, they want to be seen to do more of that. That's a kind of a human thing that is that is is in our brain, and so they so it's those kind of things that that help with um, modeling a good good behavior. I would say. Seeing some more questions, so I'm going to um, bring them in. Um, there were a couple about um, what do we do about behavior that's not in line with shared culture. So how do we address bad behavior not in line with shared culture? And what consequences um, could impact that? And also, I saw another one that was similar. Um, what's the best advisable first step to change culture where the leadership team's lack of opening up or listening has created a culture of employees' lack of taking initiative, innovation, innovation and fear? <coughs> I need to have a drink, so I'm going to ask someone else to start. <laughs> Who could come in on? Yeah, yeah. yeah um, there was a question on uh, um, how you create culture when there are urgent things to be done, and gosh, I sorry. <laughs> um, there was as well. We, we let's take all of those. So there was. <clears throat> yeah. Go ahead. Do you want to answer that one first and we will come back? That's fine. That's fine. Go ahead. Well, I want to talk about that. Um, you, you see, when we talk keep about looking that at something, we'll... when things as by the way, you know, uh, uh, there is this as well. Then what is our work about? If we say there are other things, the other things are done by bodies, for example. If the body is not well, who is going to do those urgent things? Uh, because when the body is the vehicle that is used to drive every program, and we all know the dangers of a vehicle that is broken, later on a helicopter that is broken. So if we, we don't pay attention to the vehicle, how can we imagine that we are safe. I, I, I think we, we, we need to keep talking about the bodies, the bodies that we are, because when we talk about culture, in FT, yes, we are talking about how things are done, but we're also talking about who does them. You know, we reach a stage where we don't even value our bodies. You know, you can put yourself in danger, you can drop dead, you can do, and always assume that the body will be there. But one day the body will not be there if we don't respect the body. So I think we need politicized culture so that as important as the programs. And I understand programs are fed by people, they are not carried by, by systems and structures. Those are important, but prioritize people. So I, I there are another question. I think, you know, um, the W could respond to. But I also just maybe just to add that th there is a lot to learn from other movements. If you look at the uh, uh, liberation movements, how did they do it? I mean, it's the same message again and again and again. But the big picture, the vision must always be clear. If you look you don't have to be one to see what happens. You imagine almost every week there is something. But we have this culture, we have values, and we talk about them once in a while. We think everything will be okay. And then, you know, maybe here and there. But that reinforcement, reinforcement and persistence and ensuring that people really, you know, uh, get it uh, becomes very, very important. So let's keep thinking about other movements and how they bring about change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I was thinking about that question uh, again about behavior not in line uh, with 
what we say our, our shared culture is or what we want it to be. So that made me think of um, like voicing culture, right? So of course we need to say that behavior needs to be called out. And of course leaders, as Nadia said right in the beginning, need to model that. And they need to, by the way, do that in a visible way because culture is about visible behaviors, which we therefore learn so quickly when we enter a new organization, right? So if leaders see that behavior, if sorry, if staff see that that behavior is being called out by leaders visibly, um, that can help. That's not always happening and it's also not, not always easy. So what else can we do to create a voicing culture? Um, I, I think it's important to know why is it so difficult to speak up about bad behavior, right? There are, there are uh, psychological and neurological reasons for that, right? Because when we are a bystander, um, we tend to be confused. Am I the one supposed to speak up or should I leave? Else? Am I the person to speak up? And often human beings will leave it to others because it is too threatening, too, too scary. Secondly, will it be a threat to me or will it be a threat to the person about whom I'm to speak up? You know, we don't necessarily, we still have a relationship with that person. We still may value that other person for other reasons. So knowing that by us speaking up, it is a threat to that other person is not always something we can just um, easily discard. And then of course the power dynamic, which I don't need to know anybody, uh, tell anybody in this audience, is when we speak up about uh, people who are in whatever way abusive, in a serious way or in a subtle way, yet that creates toxicity is, is, is a hard thing. So voicing culture is about um, the organization sending out signals through modeling, through um, maybe formal instruments like um, training and communication means, et cetera, is that uh, um, people are encouraged to speak up early. If you speak up early before you start thinking about it, that can really help. So it has to be a very black and white, in our communication, if X happens, then you need to do Y. So that there is no moral ambiguity. So those are a couple of things that came to my mind. Great, thanks, Huska. I wonder, Nadia, if you wanted to come in on that one. Yes, I mean, I, I fully agree with um, everything Tosca has has said. Um, I. I, I find um, the question of how to call out bad behavior a very interesting one um, because it it does create it does create internal conflict for for someone uh, to do it. But I would also jump back to an earlier point about um, the foundation also needing to be there that the that an organization promotes a safe and open space for people, for staff to, to call bad behavior out. And it is as safe to do it among peers as it is challenging authority. And I think, again, as, as Tosca mentioned, that rests heavily on leadership modeling that behavior and demonstrating that it's okay. Um, I think, you know, one of one of the interesting aspects of the lens I come at this from is the fact that I look at organizational culture as it pertains to sexual exploitation and abuse and sexual harassment. And I think there are some links to be made between that and culture in general to try and eradicate abuse of authority, abuse of power, um, discrimination in that regardless of what an organizational structure looks like you have people who at the end of the day are going to have to be held accountable for certain behaviors and i think by finding ways to to highlight the fact that those who are accountable are usually managers and supervisors and people in leadership and authority, uh, uh, roles of authority. Um, but I, I think 
having having the space for staff to be able to mobilize to hold leadership to account to respond to why the culture is not a safe one uh, to speak up I, I think these are all also very important links in, in looking at why or how one is able to call out bad behavior or not you know there is also a question about how can you make space for this kind of reflection when there are other competing priorities and in many ways it goes back to the same thing yeah. there there needs to be accountability for uh bad behavior for abuse of authority abuse of power for discrimination you know those underlying factors that destabilize workplace culture and i think when staff at all levels are able to shift light on the importance of that, then you can actually start seeing recognition of we need to make space for this as an important or an equally important priority. Right, Nadia, I, there's something coming up for me around, I feel like we need, and I, I don't know how we do this, it's very much a kind of, you know, it's just a sense that I feel like we need different a different kind of approach to like um, resolving conflict internally in our organizations or re resolving differences of opinion. Like we need ways to do that within our organizations <clears throat> that look a bit different from the kinds of processes that we have right now. And of course, sometimes we're gonna be talking about like eradicating harm and, and there might be you know people that are no longer able to work in our organizations, but there's this whole thing in between of like what does bad behavior look like and how do we like help people to behave differently and i feel like that we need processes around um that kind of accountability for behavior and then trying to resolve differences of opinion and conflict around that in ways that i just i don't i mostly don't see in organizations and i, I don't really know what they would look like but i think about you know the kinds of practice of sitting in circle in indigenous communities where people took each speak from their perspective and you know <clears throat> that we know about but but i don't see a lot of in our sector where people are able to voice where they're coming from and how they understand the situation and we're able to 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 to, to think through conflict and differences of opinion and differences of behavior together always holding that there are some kinds of harm that obviously we want to deal with in in a way that's like you know um <clears throat> that in a way that that that's different to that like not maybe not everything can be dealt with like that but i feel like around behavior and norms and like how do we model different kinds of culture i feel like there's some kind of different mechanism for exploring what that looks like that kind of yeah i i haven't I, I don't know what it is but i but i feel like we need something that's not there that's that's my sense of it i'm um i'm seeing a question from sophia and i feel like it sort of speaks maybe a bit to this to what extent the, it, do the institutional measures on safeguarding um help or, or or don't help our work on organizational culture like you know and i it, maybe it's i was coming at that sort of thing from this from a different perspective but like do those kind of in mechanisms that we have around accountability help change behaviors and culture or or are they an impediment i think it's um an interesting question and and maybe like we don't have much time left and we're probably not going to get to quite every question but maybe that's something you could each reflect on in some closing remarks now like to what extent do the systems of, and processes of accountability that we've seen in organizations help or hinder the kind of organizational culture and behavior change that we've been talking about in this session um who'd like to go first <laughs> okay i'm gonna i'm gonna yeah go ahead tosca <laughs> well, i was gonna actually invite hope because uh, i've already talked a lot <laughs> oh would you like to go first or would you like to wait for a moment <laughs> uh, but I want to, uh, I, I just want to share an example from Uganda, where there is this organization uh, where workers meet every morning before going to work, come rain, come, whatever happens, they must meet. 
if you attend a meeting, you must go and give an account of what happened. And they'll ask you questions that are situated within the culture of the organization. Because when they meet, they also talk about the culture of the organization. If you go as a consultant, you must explain why you think you are the best consultant, how you are going to contribute to the culture of the organization, and how you are going to, you know, how you are going to do the work following their own values and principles. And if you if you 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 a director, the director of the organization, and you take decisions that are not really, you know, are very respected by others, they'll they'll ask you to, you know, they they'll ask you why you did it. The, 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 person has, the person has opened the space. And I don't even think that it's a safe space, but it's a space of courage. Because he doesn't punish. I, I, and people, you know. I, I, I think when people ask those questions, they know they are not going to be punished. So they, they, they watch news together sometimes and then comment, but every fair, there is the discussion of the values and then what people are doing, people accounting for what they did. And if someone behaved badly, as you have said, behaved badly, you know, in, in the context of agreed, you know, values, in the context of the culture of the organization, that person will be asked by the whole organization, so what happened? What, you know, or you attended this meeting, you have brought back nothing, why did you go? Or you want to go to this meeting? contribute okay i know that not every organization can be like that some organizations are really huge i know that perhaps they, some don't even want to do that but at the same time i think we have got some examples of how behavior can change depending on what you have you know shared with us consistency uh, accountability and many of the the values that you have shared here it can work. So that's that. Thanks, Hope. Let's come to Nadia for some closing remarks, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I will very briefly reflect on the question that you shared, I think that was by Sophia about um, institutional measures on safeguarding, how they work with or interfere with um, uh, our work on organizational culture, whether you know it's strengthening it or shifting it or adjusting it in some way. And I think in a lot of ways, um, it, it goes a bit to the point that Hope was making um, about you know, whether or not those systems are strong and healthy. Because if they are strong and healthy and are supposed to be uh, functioning and responding the way they're intended, then it, of course, helps promote positive culture. Um, are they staff-centered? Are they victim-centered? Um, do they actually, are, are they trusted? Are they, are they transparent systems? Are they secure systems? Do they build confidence? I think those are all key elements to look at when you look at how the different institutional systems in place interplay with um, how, how organizational culture is in, in your organization, but you know, in society as a whole. You look at the infrastructure around you that you feel secures uh, the, the culture that you're a part of. And when they are healthy, you feel that the, the culture is healthy. You feel that within that culture, you are safe to look at and challenge and engage with the different uh, structures that are around you. Thanks, Nadia. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so I'm, I, I don't have expertise on safeguarding. Um, so I'll just respond to it from an organizational culture perspective. First of all, I loved what Hope said around space of courage and how that links to psychological safety. Um, I will say, and this may be a little a different take on it, but I think safeguarding measures, if the only way in which safeguarding is promoted is through um, the typical, indeed, punitive measures or 
at least measures that are at least partially punitive in nature. I think that is certainly not enough and may even be somewhat counterproductive. Um, I think if we um, are able to tie safeguarding objectives straight to overall organizational goals that everybody can buy into, including those people who feel that this has nothing to do with them, even though it does, of course, have to do with them. Um, but if we can link it, um, safeguarding goals, into overall organizational goals, including brass tax business goals, right? Like revenue, et cetera, that organizational leaders also really care about and are told to care about by the stakeholders that they need to keep happy. Um, then these kind of meta goals, these supraordinate goals are, are really helpful uh, to, to offset the kind of punitive nature of that. Uh, that may sound very instrumentalist, but I do think that that is important so that everybody can buy into it. So much, Tosca, and all of you for joining this session. I'm going to close the session now because we have one more session today on um, leadership in a world of unheaval and upheaval and crisis. And that's going to, I've put the link into the event chat and I'll put it in this session chat as well for people who want to join after this session. But thank you so much, Nadia, Tosca, and Hope for sharing this space with me to talk about culture and behavior change in aid organizations. Tomorrow morning, we have a session that is being hosted by Oxfam International and by IFRC, and it's a discussion space about culture and behavior change in organizations. And they're going to be curating a space for, to have a conversation about how to share learning around cultural behavior change in organizations between different organizations in the sector and come together around the topic to share experience learning and so forth and there'll be a chance in that session for people to get into groups and discuss how they want to share and share learning on this topic going forward so do come along to that session if you're interested it's um it's in the morning um check the schedule but it's called something very similar to this um session the schedule is visible in the reception area and it's there's a choice of sessions at that time tomorrow morning so um i don't want to say what it is because right now i might get it wrong because i'm not looking at the schedule and of course it's different in different time zones so please check the schedule if you'd like to join that session and if you're confused about it in any way just send us an email or a message and we'll let you know exactly when it is but thanks everybody stay well and we'll see you if you're able and want to join us in the next session very shortly it begins i think in about six minutes at quarter to the hour um okay stay well and thank you all thank you Bye. Thank you.